Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about songs and calls of birds as well as song learning. Okay, some key terminology to know when we're talking about avian acoustics would be thinking about vocal signals. So birds can send a lot of signals that are vocal, they come from their syrinx or non-vocal. Um, so there are a variety of vocal signals, including songs, which are often longer in duration and more complex in the numbers of notes and how the notes are configured. And they tend to be related to breeding. They tend to, tend to be related to mate attraction or to territory defense, and that's territory defense of a breeding territory. And that compares to a call. A call tends to be a simpler type of vocalization and the calls have a purpose that's different from territory defense or mate attraction. Um, talk calls can be given to signal the presence of other members of a group. It can be for communication during migration. It can be to alarm others of predators. They can have a variety of purposes. Um, and another important term in this um, this section is understanding that there are two types of birds in the order Passeriformes. Passeriformes, we learned from other readings, the most diverse order of birds in all of the birds. In fact, almost half of all 10,000 bird species are in the order Passeriformes. These are our songbirds. Within Passeriformes, there are two groups, so two subdivisions, the sub ossine passerines, and these um, are comprised mainly of flycatchers, New World flycatchers, and some other groups of birds. Um, and then there are the Ossine passerines. And m most, well, actually, um, mo more, most of the bird diversity in the Passeriformes are Ossine passerines, but there are quite a lot of sub Ossine passerines. Sub Ossine passerines are no noted for, in particular, their inheritance of their song. And so when you hear the song of a sub Ossine passerine, that song is genetically encoded at birth. And so it carries a lot of important genetic signal. So um, uh, there are a number of flycatchers that look really, really similar, but they have different songs. And that song is, is a, a genetic um, trait. So a difference in a song for something like a, a flycatcher is really a difference in a species. Ossine passerines are songbirds that learn their song. So they have to go through a phase of hearing their song, practicing it, and then really learning it um, through their life. So just to sort of make sure that you know, um, vocals, there are signals that birds can use to communicate with one another that are not vocal. And so um, a great example in North America are woodpeckers. So you'll hear woodpeckers drumming at certain times of year, particularly in the spring. And not only do those drums have, can, can be distinguished at the species level, so here are spectrograms of um, the downy woodpecker, hairy woodpecker, and um, looks like probably yellow-bellied sapsucker here. And they have different cadences, and you can identify the species based on these signals. These signals are also territorial signals, so when you hear that, sort of sound of a woodpecker drumming, that's not foraging noise, that's a territorial display. And they tend to try to find the most resonant piece of wood or material, sometimes it's a pipe, to make that sound because it's, it's meant to be emitted for a long distance to announce the presence of that bird in its territory. Um, so, um, but the other, there are a lot of vocal signals, including songs. And so here is um, a lovely um, image from the textbook of the song of a Pacific Wren. And Pacific Wrens um, have a, quite a diverse repertoire of songs. And even within a single song of a Pacific Wren, you find lots of variation in the sorts of notes. There are buzzy notes, there are different elements of this song. When you actually hear it with your ear, it, it's passing by you so rapidly. You can recognize it as a Pacific Wren, but it's very hard to differentiate all these sounds. Um, and then I'm going to just zoom to, it's important to see that um, what, what a, something like a Pacific Wren song versus a call looks like um, 
when you look at them side by side. So I'm actually gonna go to this spectrogram. So you can do this as well. It's mentioned in the caption of this figure. You can go to the image of the spectrogram uh, and actually listen to this song. And so I'm gonna make sure I'm sharing my screen with the correct screen here. Okay. And here are some sound visualizations. So we're gonna scroll through. and play these different elements of the Pacific Rim song. Okay, so you can see how complex that song is. And hopefully you notice from phrase to phrase that there were differences. And you can go back and listen to this again on your own. Um, here is that song at half speed. So here's another chance to sort of listen to that. understanding the purposes of mixing these sounds up, making them longer, shorter, different between different phrases of the song is a really active area of study in um, acoustic ornithology. And so some say that possibly this is um, a means of displaying something about the bird's fitness, um, sort of like somebody improvising a song. Um, and the, 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 the difficulty variability of that may reflect something about um, the fitness of the bird. And often these songs will include phrases of neighbor songs. And so there's something to do with signaling to neighbors that can be really important too. And it's found that these songs can be much more variable in environments where the birds are resident year round and they may be holding territories year round. And so there are ideas about um, signaling very acute attunement to the environment. So this is a bird that understands its environment very well, its local environment, and it's signaling some very complex information about that environment. Whereas birds that tend to migrate and don't end up in the same place 
from year to year, from breeding season to breeding season, may have more stereotyped or similar common across between individuals' um, songs, because at that point, signaling to others that you're of the same species becomes of a higher value. Um, and just one more go at this at quarter speed. I might not play the whole um, the whole series, but you can play it. You can link to this and play it. As we're hearing it right now, there's some ideas that have been, I've, I've thought of this and I've read others that have thought of this is birds have really high metabolic rates. They're moving and processing the environment at really rapid speeds. Is it possible that when you hear that rapid, not slowed down song of a Pacific wren, that it's different from what they're detecting? Maybe they're, they are able to detect more of that differentiation in the notes as we are detecting it here at a slowed down speed something to think about. So they might be understanding and processing the signals from these songs in a different way. So I hope you also notice that this is not just a bunch of jarble. So there are these different distinct elements in these songs that you see time and time again, and that these birds are producing these sounds really rapidly, four times faster than we're hearing right now. So I'm actually gonna pause this, and um, I think you get a good idea of it. Something else that's um, useful to see is when you compare, this song to a Pacific Wren call note. And I'm just gonna play, show you a call note, link to a call note. And I'll pull that up. This is from the Macaulay Library of Natural Sound. It's also a Cornell entity. And you can see, actually, this is a song with all these complex notes, and then you have some calls um, examples of calls here, and so I'm going to play one. This is a very typical Pacific Rim call. It could be a contact call. It tends to be when it's really rapid that it's an alarm call. Okay, and so um, go back to my presentation. So that's an example of a song and a call, the differences. Go back to the actual slideshow here. Sometimes there we go. So here's another comparison, and you can actually link to these in the slides that I've posted. Um, this is a, a um, common yellowthroat. And the song that you hear of a common yellowthroat tends to across this range be much more uniform. And this is a migratory bird, um, and it's probably related to this migratory lifestyle or signaling to others um, the presence of, of another of its own species is more important than this very specific refined um, differentiation and song that you tend to find with birds that reside in places um, for long periods of time. And I've also posted a link to a common yellowthroat call note. And one thing you'll notice is it sounds somewhat similar to the Pacific Grand call note in that 
a lot of call notes are single chip notes. And you can start to, if you train your ear, listen for slight differences in the quality of those chip notes to differentiate the species. But during this time of year, you can also wait until the bird sings and that, that can be really useful to link those two. Here is one exception to the rule that we find in the Pacific Northwest and other parts of North America is um, chickadees. So chickadees, by comparison to um, most other songbirds have relatively simple songs and more complex calls. And they, these, these are a highly social species. They tend to move together in family groups and also will um, associate with mixed species flocks. And their call notes have more, probably carry more signal in them, have more information in them um, than you find with other species because of their social lifestyle. And so, um, We've played this in another um, video, but here is a contact call. Play it again. Here is an alarm call. And these alarm calls can be highly variable with the number of D notes tending to reflect the magnitude of a danger. And then quite simple songs. Um, they're an interesting model organism for studying the evolution of these songs or, the, or when songs might be variable and when they're not because black-capped chickadees through much of their range have that hey sweetie song. But in a couple of areas in North America, there is some variation on the hey sweetie song, including here in the Pacific Northwest where the populations of Pacific, uh, not Pacific, of black-capped chickadees are less mobile. They're not moving around with changes in seasonality to the same degree that you're finding in large parts of their range. And so we see some variation that seems to be related to um, the differences in their call. And there's a series of famous studies that happened um, on the East Coast on Nantucket Island that, that compare this. And that's another place where you find some variation in this song of the black capped chickadee. And so the final thing I want to talk about was songs. So it's important to know the difference between songs and calls and to start to listen to variation in bird songs. Even within a species, there can be variations and there may be very interesting ec ecological and evolutionary reasons as to why there are variations. Um, and start to, to listen to for those and sort of think about this bird's annual cycle. But it's also important to know that birds learn their songs and they go through, or at least Aussie passerines do, and they go through phases of learning that are actually pretty analogous to the um, acquisition of human speech. And so um, this is an image from another ornithology textbook, the Gill Ornithology textbook, um, that goes through the four basic phases of song learning in an Ossian passerine. They have a critical learning period, and this is a very early period. Um, it, it, usually lasts less than a year and starts pretty early after hatching. And this is a period in which the bird um, must be exposed to its own song. So it may or may not be vocalizing at all during this period, but it's hearing its own song from its parents or its neighbors or from other sources, and it's collecting information. Um, and in fact, there have been a number of studies that have found that if you if you don't provide that song to a bird during that critical learning period, it can't learn its song. It can't learn its song in the same way it does when it's exposed to that critical learning period. There's a lot of interesting studies on human speech about their critical times where young children must also hear human speech um, and that facilitates the acquisition of speech. There's a silent period. It's a long period. It can be as long as eight months in which syllables are learned during um, the early early critical learning period and they're stored without practice or rehearsal. So at part of that, this part of this critical learning period is a silent period. There's listening and, and it, you can't observe what the bird is doing other than it's storing information. Then there's some period, usually fairly early on during this critical learning period, um, it, although it can be as late as starting eight months after the bird is hatched, where the bird starts to practice its song. And actually, if you, um, we're gonna go into a silent period here in mid to late July through about mid-August where you're not hearing a lot of birds singing. And then you'll start to hear birds singing some more again as we move into the autumn. And if you listen carefully, and you can hear this happening now too, you will hear birds practicing some song. So some birds 
up in these northern, more northern latitudes start practicing subsong pretty early after they're hatched. So this is a practice period and it's analogous to an infant babbling. It bridges the gap between the perception, so understanding and being exposed to that song, and the actual attunement and refinement and perfection of the song, so the sensory motor stages of vocal learning. The song, subsong period is a period of practice without it actually having any communication. Perhaps subsong is a form of vocal play. And so um, there was, there's a slide of the uh, white-throated sparrow in the previous video, and there's a nice set um, image of that in the textbook, and you can actually play those songs as well on the, the site that I just linked to, of a white-throated sparrow practicing its, practicing its song during subsong, and then song crystallization. And when you hear this, what it almost sounds like is it really sounds like the bird's practicing and it almost sounds like it's singing to itself. It seems quiet and very inward and it's not sending out a lot of signal through that song. And so start to listen for that. And then finally there's song crystallization, which is the next practice period during which the bird transform its very variable jumbled sort of practice song into a real song. And there tends to be a weeding process that happens during song crystallization where the bird is selecting key elements of its song um, to place into its repertoire. Now there's a lot of variability with song crystallization. Some birds complete song crystallization and have one song or, or one or two versions of their song and that's it. They have settled on that perfect song and that's it. Others continue to modify their songs a lot or even or slightly um, depending on changes in neighbors and these sorts of things. Other birds perpetually integrate new sounds into their songs and um, great examples of that are birds that engage in mimicry. Um, birds that engage in mimicry and make the sounds of other birds and animals and sometimes even non-human machine noise um, are, have a, an elongated phase or they have active areas of their brain that allow them to not become too rigid or set in their song learning, continue to add new components to the song. But many birds don't, they settle on a song within about the first year of life and that it stays pretty constant. And there's been a lot of really interesting research in recent years about anthropogenic noise and how that influences song learning in birds and all sorts of other interesting things. So um, studying the acquisition of song and studying song learning and um, bird song has lots and lots of interesting implications.